Hi, Kitmina. Um, Hi, Abhishek. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Yes, I can hear you fine. So, uh, thanks everyone for waiting. I think we can get started. So, today we have Kitmin Hevage with us. He is uh, currently a senior policy advisor working with uh, basically across around 18 Asian countries. So, today we'll just be talking about um, the IMF agreement. Uh, kind of what it is, what it means for Sri Lanka, and also a little bit beyond that, kind of what are the next steps for Sri Lanka. So, as always, you can put your questions in chat or just uh, click the question and icon and send it across and we'll deal with them at the end. So, to kind of kick things off and give everyone a bit of context, I'm sure you all know the IMF board basically approved uh, the extended fund facility arrangement uh, on the 20th of March. There's been a lot of talk around it. So, two kind of um, ways people have started talking it is one that it's kind of a bailout they refer it to as the IMF bailout and on the other hand you have people who calls it kind of like this loan and we're going back into debt so maybe we can just start off by kind of clarifying exactly what is this so-called IMF agreement or the extended fund facility we've uh, gotten into uh, thanks Avishka and first of all thanks for having me uh, I want to start off by clarifying that I'm speaking on my in my personal capacity uh, so what I kind of discussed here shouldn't be affiliated with any organization that I'm uh, part of. Uh, so to answer your question, um, it's basically a bailout loan. So it's, it's the, the two terms that you use, uh, then they're not different. They're basically the same thing. Um, and what happens is the IMF is a lender of last resort. What that means is that when countries are in crisis and they need uh, assistance uh, and they need kind of uh, dollars basically to uh, show themselves up uh, then they go to the IMF and, and the IMF loans out money uh, at a certain interest rate uh, and that is what has happened so basically because Sri Lanka was in this uh, position uh, and we didn't have dollars in our in, in our current account um, and our balance of payments was more or less negative uh, we needed dollars right um, so what, what that meant is that, A, because we didn't have funds to pay off our debts, uh, we also didn't have funds to buy imports, essential imports, and that's why we had full uh, shortages, gas shortages, etc. Uh, and we needed some form of a bailout loan from the IMF uh, to show up our reserves, uh, which would then allow, um, allow us to kind of do other things. So we can, we can discuss those later. But to answer your question, it's basically a bailout loan. Uh, what it is, is uh, 3 billion US dollars, roughly 3 billion US dollars across four years. Uh, and it's divided every six months. Uh, there will be uh, a disbursement, right? So, so that's around 400 million per, per disbursement. So that's eight tranches. Um, and that will happen across four years. So from 2023 to 2026. Uh, so that, that's 3 billion from the IMF and because now the IMF has come on board and they approved this uh, extended fund facility, we then also have access to a separate uh, uh, assistant, development assistance package uh, from the World Bank and the ADB, uh, roughly around 3.75 billion. So I think we can look at the IMF alone is a 3 billion package uh, and then together with 3.75 billion US dollars from the World Bank and ADB, it's 6.75 billion in total. So what I'm getting it is uh, the country's in a really bad state. The IMF comes in and basically loans to us when no one else will. And this kind of basically unlocks more opportunities for us to kind of show up our foreign reserves and get our kind of uh, housing order, basically. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I mean, there's a singular saying like, Pinata Salidin uh, that, that's basically what's, what happens, right? So when countries are in crisis, uh, you can't go to, the, at, at most you'll get a few hundred million from neighboring countries like India, China, Bangladesh, etc. But they don't have the sort of big amounts that they can give you for free, right? So either you take, they take a bilateral loan from them, uh, or you go to private creditors, uh, or you go to the IMF. The problem is that because we didn't we default we didn't have money basically to pay off our debts, um, bilateral creditors also weren't willing to give us money uh, at at interest rates. 
uh, they don't have enough money to give us for free uh, and private creditors definitely won't going to give us money um, and, and therefore the imf is a, a lend of last resort so basically we will be paying around 4% of interest per annum uh, the average interest rate is around 4% across these uh, across these years the the repayment period is 13 years so from 2023 to 2036 um so 4% uh, average annual interest so uh, just to clarify when does the repayment kind of begin because we basically get the money in uh, stages for four years then does the repayment begin with interest soon after that uh, how does that work yeah so the repayment will start in uh, from next year onwards uh, but it's a small percentage so a very small amount um and what it will allow is it basically peaks the most amount we have to pay is around 478 million uh 478 million uh dollars in 2031 so that's the that's where when we have to pay back the most so it's it's structured across the 13 years so that we don't have to pay much now uh, in the short term we have to pay a lot uh, the, the most of the chunk in 2031 and then we taper off at the end So since one we also to pay that and then at the same time we also have other debts to manage it's kind of almost uh, like a gamble or a second chance where we need to make sure we do the right thing and we don't essentially let this opportunity go to waste uh, but just before we move into maybe the more details of the agreement and also kind of um, the sense of what we do to get a, uh, go for I just want to um, maybe just uh, go over the different programs we've had mainly we used basically the standby um, if i'm not uh, mistaken uh, it's, it's a short term agreement but this time we've gone for the extended fund facility or the eff which is the uh, four year longer term so could you perhaps just highlight the differences between these two programs and uh, perhaps the purpose or the aim of the eff compared to one of those more shorter uh, almost surface level kind of programs yeah so basically when countries face shocks uh, so it can be for example during the pandemic um, a, a lot of countries went to the imf for short term adjustment uh, program so th- those are two year uh, programs the imf will give a few uh, million or maybe billion uh, it's a very short term and then the country is able to kind of repay it basically to uh, to protect it, itself against short term shocks uh, so uh, this is why Uh, a lot of uh, economists uh, uh, quite a few of us were recommending the government to go to the imf in 2020 uh, because we were in in a crisis and it was obvious that we were in a crisis uh, and had we gone to the imf then we wouldn't have had to borrow this big an amount firstly secondly we wouldn't have had to default on our debt right um uh, and thirdly we wouldn't have been paying this the 4% of interest at the time interest rates were much lower so we would have paid much lower interest at the time as well so basically the the, the decision not to go to the imf at that time has led to a lot of catastrophic economic uh, consequences which led to the crisis last year uh, and now we are going to the imf without any money in the bank uh, basically and then that is why we have now uh, had to go to the eff the extended funds facility uh, which is structured across the 13 years okay um so then just jumping back into kind of how this program is going to work so one thing about it is like you said uh, the money is given in stages but my understanding is also it is contingent upon uh, to an extent meeting certain targets and at the same time there is also a review process uh, to make sure that basically the country doesn't go off track so maybe we can start with just kind of explaining how the imf review process works uh, throughout this period uh, so the imf will do a review every 6 months uh, before they disperse uh, the tranche that was that we spoke about earlier so the like i said the 3 billion is divided into 8 Uh, and every six, it, it's equal across the eight uh, the the eight tranches, uh, and that means that every six months the IMF will do a review to see whether we have um, fulfilled the criteria, um, and then we can discuss what the criteria is. I'm sure you'll ask me later. Uh, and once uh, uh, once the IMF is satisfied that those criteria are met, then they will they will disperse that tranche. So the the 400. Or, uh, if we 
he for example don't fulfill the conditions and kind of implement the reforms and so on then the imf has the right um, and the legitimacy to hold back the money uh, and not and not this person okay so you kind of touched upon basically where i was going to follow up with that uh, since it's so vital that we have continued access to these funds uh, turning to some of the targets or the the reforms that uh, they expect us to do um we can maybe start with some of the more immediate ones uh, when the first review is coming up and what they kind of expect us to have done by then um, and also whether the government has taken any steps to kind of uh, completing this first part of the program mm -hmm. uh, well uh, there are broadly speaking six objectives that are uh, in the imf program and by the way this agreement is publicly available so anyone who claims that it's a secret is lying to you uh it's all it's, it's public available you can read the staff report uh that is there um so uh, the first and i think the big one is fiscal consolidation uh and under that there are several factors and what fiscal consolidation means is that uh the government has enough money to operate right um and what so the first one is revenue um and that is for example we've seen the tax increases that we've seen the tax adjustments that we've seen recently and why this was necessary is that in 2021 our tax revenue to gdp ratio was 7.3% which is one of the lowest in the country, in in the world sorry so if a government doesn't have tax revenue it it can it doesn't have money to spend on basic public services like education healthcare defense infrastructure etc so to then cover the those costs you borrow right and then you get into debt and that is why we have got into this mess because we have a very low tax revenue and then then we try to cover it with debt and then we eventually don't have money to pay off that that is a very simplified version of what has happened so the first thing is to kind of improve our uh, revenue and according to the imf estimates the tax increases that have happened the tax reforms that have happened uh, will likely increase it by around 6% of gdp so from around 8% here if it had, had, not, had these reforms not been done it will go to around 14% uh, if it is estimated uh, so the tax is one thing uh, the second one is on the spending side of it so it's not good enough just on the in, in kind of taking in taxes it's also important to Uh, reform of spending and so for example loss making uh, state owned enterprises for example sri lankan airlines right is the most famous one uh, and others and they mean so that we also don't spend on unnecessary you know infrastructure projects that don't bring any revenue right um, you know phallic symbols in the middle of the city capital for example uh, and then also kind of making sure that we Make other spending, so for example, public sector spending, and so on. So making sure that our revenue, our expenditure is controlled. Uh, the third thing is on making sure that our social safety nets are a lot more efficient. So for example, if you look at Samurthi, um, Samurthi is very inefficient, and this this has been covered by a lot of state economies who are much better than me. Uh, for example, IPS has produced quite a few reports on Samurthi. Uh, which shows that because of the politicization of samurthi um it has it has it means that a lot of people who are not in the low income sector are actually getting paid samurthi right and this is not what samurthi and social safety nets are meant to do right so what the imf has recommended is to reform the social safety net process and make sure so that we actually target people who need it so we are making sure so that the people who absolutely need the money get the money instead of basing it on political whims and fancies right um and, and and those are i think the big short term things um in terms of the fiscal consolidation the second thing is in terms of broader governance reform so for example things like the independence of the central bank now we saw the the consequences of the politicization of the central bank because when you appoint politicians to become central bank governor they are thinking about the what's best for the next election so that is what the independence of the central bank means because then the central bank can take steps that are best for the economy rather than the political party they represent 
right? So independence of central bank is very important. There's also some things on kind of corruption, vulnerabilities, and so on. They have, they, they have recommended a diagnostic that, is, that will be published in September. And based on that, there will be anti-corruption laws being proposed and so on. So that's number two. The third thing, and I think this is where kind of more uh, impact, where we are, we have, we have to kind of think of it in a more long-term basis, is debt sustainability. Uh, so as we discussed earlier, we have defaulted on our debt, which means that we have to restructure our debt. So we have to, uh, now, all, most of our main debtors, uh, lenders, uh, like uh, the bilaterals, so China, India, the Paris Club, uh, have all agreed uh, to restructure in principle, but the exact restructuring process hasn't been agreed on yet. So we have about an year, uh, including the bilaterals as well as the private lenders, to restructure our debt and make sure that um, our debt is in a sustainable uh, position uh, by around 2027. Um, and that, that is kind of the broad image. So I think those are the three big uh, ones uh, in terms of fiscal consolidation, uh, governance reforms, and debt uh, restructuring. Uh, and underlying, in, in addition to that, there are other kind of smaller things uh, which are also important, uh, like financial stability, so making sure that the domestic banking system is stable, uh, making sure that we have economic growth, so it's not just austerity, right? It's not just kind of cutting uh, any sort of uh, all the money and not doing anything. We have to make sure that our growth, that our economy also grows. Uh, so there are other things as well. Those, those are also factors that will play. Um, but I think those are the, the three big things are what I spoke about. Here. Yeah. So just to go back, I think uh, one thing that really was really highlighted was the emphasis on the social safety nets uh, in the report. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, they also had basically stated how we need to have a minimum spend, uh, a certain spend on the social benefits, and it it definitely was focused on that. Um, one thing I'd also uh, like to just go back on, in addition to uh, the revenue service, talk about the expenditure and governance. I think there was an overlap when they started. Uh, they were basically talking about making sure we have a framework in place to manage these uh, public expenditure. Because I think one, one reason is basically bad economic governance. Um, so what are your thoughts in terms of uh, that aspect of it? Um, do you think those are things that uh, basically, do you think that the governance uh, kind of hard reforms that we call legislative changes are some things that we would we should ideally try to uh, push forward and get through first, or is it something that we we kind of uh, work with the uh, raising the revenue, maybe uh, rationalizing expenditure, and then we move into uh, kind of how does the sequencing work there? So I think these are the reforms that 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 we spoke about earlier and kind of overall. Honestly speaking, these are reforms that we should be doing whether the IMF tells us or not, right? So having responsible spending, making sure that we have decent revenue mechanisms, uh, making sure that we close down corruption, vulnerabilities, etc. Right? anti corruption. I think these are reforms that need to be done. But I think in terms of your question, um, I would argue argue that it's important that we go start with these sort of governance reforms uh, as alongside the revenue reforms, right? Uh, because the public has to have confidence in what, we are, what the reforms are, right? So if only the revenue reforms are being done um, and, um, you know, the people are feeling the consequences, for example, there are protests right now, you know, cost of living, etc. But if, if nothing is done on the governance side, then they are not going to be confident with what, what's going on because then all the responsibility is being pushed to the people and the people who govern the country are left spot free, right? So it's important that the government also goes and ensures that and implements these governance reforms because I think that is going to be a fundamentally important factor in generating the trust amongst the public and improving public buy-in for the IMF program and these reforms and, 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 and other economic reforms because without governance reform the people are going to wonder why why should we any of this why should we agree to any of this if the our politicians are still corrupt you know if they're expending it the same if everything that led to the crisis is the same now and in the future then why is it that only taxes are included? 
so i think i think so the governance reforms are absolutely important i would i would argue that they should be prioritized uh, in the next couple of months yes on one track yeah um so just a reminder for everyone who is listening in that you all can uh, put your questions in the comments or there's also a question icon and you all can send in directly um so just turning back to uh, a couple of things that you actually said that i thought was quite interesting one is that we any we need to do a uh, kind of these reforms but i am if kind of came in or not we need to kind of own these reforms and also in terms of in the imf's viewpoint uh, it's a lot on stabilization it's a lot on kind of getting getting the things kind of sorted but we also need to think about growth because like you said uh, the bet is that we are able to replay this off uh, eventually that means we kind of grow uh, after we've done the initial kind of first steps we need to grow out of it so and as the advocates is titled kind of beyond the imf what are some of the reforms that you think sri lanka itself needs to take um, kind of to also start focus at growing or at least laying the foundation for growth at this point uh I think fundamentally our economic future lies in how competitive our export sector is going to be in the future, right? Uh, because we are a small economy, right? It, 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 and we don't have the sort of kind of natural resources in terms of oil and diamonds and all these other stuff, right? Uh, so we have to depend on our export sector. Uh, and unfortunately, what has happened over the past twenty years or so is that our export sector has become very uncompetitive in the global market. Now this is not because of labor costs right uh, some people say that it's because of labor costs and pr middle that is not the case there are other middle income countries around the world that compete very well in the global market the reason why sri lanka has failed to compete and our export sector has actually deteriorated over the past decades is because of our protectionist inward looking economic policies because we have tried to implement a weird import substitution economic policy uh, and, and and that is uh, that is not tenable that is not workable in sri lanka because at the, uh, ultimately we have to import raw materials to produce these import substitution uh, goods right so what we need to look at it is improving our competitiveness in the world and to do that we need to move away from protectionism and we need to encourage more foreign direct investment in the country we need to encourage more private investment from sri lanka into the economy so for example if you look at economic growth from 2009 onwards so after the post conflict growth right even though average growth was you know 7 8% during that let's say 10 year period right but that it was purely based on debt led infrastructure projects and that doesn't create dollar revenue into the economy right so you can have all the economic growth but people were not getting jobs better jobs right uh, you have better roads but people were not getting fit better right uh, so the three lane highways lead to absolutely rural and poor areas right so that's the problem with how our economy grew in the in the recent past so what we need to do instead is to ensure that it's much easier for the private sector and for um, foreign as well as domestic private sector to invest and to grow our economy and 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 to kind of produce more competitive exports so that we have more um in export revenue in coming into the country and therefore then we have more dollars and we are in a much more stable outlook so this is both in terms of manufacturing uh, process and that's important we need to improve our export manufacturing sector and also services you know we have things like it tourism etc uh, and those two things need to go hand in hand uh, and but but it's important that particularly the manufacturing sector that we need to focus on improving our competitiveness and, and improve yes thanks for really bringing that because um, i mean something that's there is yes um even the report kind of touches a little bit on growth but uh, again there is a lot more that we can go beyond and do and something we talk about a lot here is for example the protectionist tariffs for example you have your para tariffs and at, at this point you, you don't even need to go there because you have kind of your all your import bans and everything which uh, can also uh, there is issue i understand uh, of the managing kind of a foreign exchange but at the same time you also have issue that it can basically uh, be detrimental to your economic growth uh, 
So in that context of one competitiveness, which I would assume one is raising these kind of protectionist barriers and two also kind of the inward reforms that uh, make it easy for these SMEs to compete, the exporters to compete. Uh, what are some of some kind of concrete reforms or things that uh, government policymakers uh, or everyone can look for, uh, look for or like at least take steps to do in this kind of short term? So I think you touched on an important thing. So I'm not arguing, I'm not saying that we need to remove all tariffs, right? I think, I think, I think the realistic, we need some protectionism. I think there are certain industries and sectors that need to be protected and so on, right? So, but what we need to do is make sure that we remove the protectionism that actually undermines our export sector competitiveness, right? So a good example of this is the construction sector, right? Uh, we have tariffs on cement, we have tariffs on tiles and all these other things and other kind of construction raw materials, which then increases the cost of construction. That is why real estate prices, housing prices, houses are so expensive to build in Sri Lanka. So what happens then? People then have to borrow big amounts, millions, to build a house, right? And then, if you look at it, like one of the big reasons why people are struggling right now is not because of the tax increase, but rather because of the interest increase, right? Because people have taken two, three loans to build a house, to buy a car and, you know, fund education, right? And as a result, when interest rates increase, they are finding it difficult because they don't have money. And then obviously the taxes have also, but the actual impact of the tax increase is quite low compared to the impact in increase in interest rates, right? So I think what we need to then do is make sure that we reduce those para tariffs and tariffs that undermine our competitiveness and the cost of production. So that's one thing. The second thing is to making it a lot easier for small and medium enterprises to do business in Sri Lanka, right? So for example, there are big structural issues uh, for them to access things like land or to access things like credit, right? Because of the government regulation on, on things on land, uh, credit facilities, etc. Uh, and these are done to protect certain industries and done to protect certain individuals. So I think those are again those are things that can then help SMEs to create more value in the economy, right? And then to kind of plug into bigger uh, and broader supply chains. Uh, the third thing is kind of, I mean, we, we, I mean, people talk about this all the time and everyone has been talking about this for decades, is female labor force participation, right? I mean, I mean, the legislation currently are kind of from the Victorian era um, that don't allow, you know, that, that, that respect women to work in certain industries, you know, at certain times uh, and so on. And also improving things like maternal health care, right, and, and making sure that child care is affordable and available uh, and, you know, work from home, flexible hours. These are all things that are, can be adjusted through legislative reform. And more than 70% of uh, women in this country are not taking part in the labor force, at least the formal labor force. Right? So I think there are, there are legislative uh, changes that can be made to improve and increase labor force participation that will then unlock these opportunities. And so these are these are all kind of things that are at the are low hanging fruits, right? Uh, that are not being plucked uh, because of you know uh, uh, both structural but also political uh, decisions. Thanks. The interesting that you mentioned uh, the labor force participation because uh, actually, basically, Advocata Two is having their event on the 30th tomorrow, um, focusing on uh, reforms basically to empowerment due to the crisis. And I think one of the key takeaways, essentially, from kind of all of that, is um, while the IMF agreement kind of did uh, bring about or is at least needed in terms of the financial aid at this point, and like like you've uh, phrased it, uh, a bailout loan. There is a lot more that we can do that is kind of not in this paper and that can actually come from uh, within. Uh, before we wrap up, uh, just putting it out there, if anyone have any questions, you can just drop it in the comments or there's a question icon, you can just, uh, I think, tap that and send that across as well. Um, so just before we wrap up, we wait for that. Can you just to kind of, I know this might be a bit of a tough question, but to kind of get your thoughts on uh, Basically, where 2023 will lead us. Uh, are you kind of optimistic about it, or 
uh, a, a bit more on the kind of pessimistic view. Uh, what what are your thoughts? Because we do have a lot of challenges. One, like you said, we have to we have to kind of meet these reforms and these barriers. One, to ensure the funding keep, keeps coming. And two, we also have to kind of tackle this debt restructuring, which is uh, kind of fundamental something we need to do. And also, thirdly, you said, like you pointed out, there is so much more beyond the IMF. This is just kind of like the first step or like the cornerstone. So with all of this and all of this needing to happen soon for Sri Lanka, um, kind of where are your thoughts lie? I mean, like I said, I mean, the IMF is not the savior, you know, just because we've got the IMF loan doesn't mean that all our troubles are gone and, you know, we hold hands and can sing Kumbaya, right? Uh, there's a reason why this is the 17th time we have gone to IMF, right? Because in the in across the 16 previous times, what happens is we get a uh, IMF assistance, we get IMF uh, uh, assistance, we go to a program, we start implementing things for about a year and a half, and then we give it up and go back to our bad days, right? Uh, and then we go through this cycle. So every four or five years, we go through a cycle of going to the IMF. The difference, of course, is that this we have never faced this sort of crisis. Right? So we have are now in a position where, if we don't implement the reforms that are needed, right, to stabilize the economy and, and improve our economic position, we are going to go into another crisis within the next four or three years. Right. So it is absolutely imperative to implement this reform. There is no way that we can back off one year in because we are in that deep uh, crisis. So the fact that we have no other option kind of gives me optimism or maybe I should say hope that maybe this time around we will actually implement the reforms that we need to implement right? and that we will go through the process. Um, and I think that is important because at, at that position we need to make sure that we are fiscally responsible uh, and our debt is also sustainable right? and, and also we, that we are in terms of our trade that we are competing. So that gives me some hope that we have no other option but to it. Of course, I'm a political skeptic. Um, so just because you have laws doesn't mean that things are going to be rosy. It's all about implementation of those laws. So for example, there's an anti-corruption law in the pipeline. Just because we have a law doesn't mean that it's going to be implemented properly, right? So the fundamental thing here is, Avishka, independence of institutions. So we spoke a little bit about central bank independence, but also other institutions, the judiciary, the civil service, right? The fact that the bureaucrats also are independent from political interference and that they are able to implement these reforms and not be swayed by political reasons. Right? So I think those sort of broader reforms that are not, not part of this IMF, but those are the things that will actually make me hopeful and optimistic of the future if we can implement them. Uh, so I'm hopeful that hope, I'm hopeful that we might be able to uh, get through this because if we don't, we are definitely going to be in another crisis and, and actually a bigger crisis than what we faced three to last year. Uh, if we don't uh, reform, because uh, the, the, the the circumstances are such. So hopefully, recognizing that across the board, it shouldn't matter what political party you're from. These reforms are needed for the betterment of the economy and for the betterment of the people. Right? Uh, uh, being responsible with your money, being responsible with how you spend your debt, making sure that you are not corrupt, independence of institutions are all good things and shouldn't uh, shouldn't waver based on what political party you vote for. Uh, and hopefully our political leaders realize that as well. Uh, thanks a lot for that, Kipin. I think um, you balanced out both being opti not too optimistic but also not too pessimistic there. Um, so I think with the basically the chat coming to end, uh, I'd like to say thank you for your time and thank you all listeners, anyone who missed out basically. Um, we've covered quite a lot, I think. You kind of dispel kind of the myths around it, give a bit of clarity to exactly how this fund works, how the money comes, how the repayment works. Uh, also give a broad overview of what this uh, kind of agreement entails.
and more importantly that there's a lot we have to do beyond this both institutionally and also kind of three main policy areas with related to competitiveness yeah, and the trade the SMEs and the female labor force participation so I think you've given uh, everyone who listened in and also me quite a lot to think about in terms of kind of how we move forward from here uh, and where kind of uh, as citizens as well as where our focuses uh, should be so uh, thanks a lot for that Kitpina uh, any kind of last words before you wrap up uh, no, thank Thank you very much for having me uh, and uh, happy to join today. Thanks. Okay. Thanks a lot. See you everyone.